Well, thank you very much, Bob, for a beautiful introduction. I sure appreciate it. And I appreciate all of you being here tonight. Uh, we all have many things in our busy lives, so it's wonderful that you came up to share this evening with, with all of us here tonight. And uh, yes, it's, it's fun to be back at the Natural History Institute. I attended the webinar last night. Uh, one of the most impressive books I think I've ever read, and photographically it's beautiful too, is the book on snakes that Harry Green wrote. What's the, the title of that? Snakes, the Evolution of Mystery in Nature. The Evolution of Mystery. Snakes, the Evolution of Mystery in Nature. I like to call it the Harry Green Snake Book. <laughs> <laughs> that gives you an interesting image. Okay, I promise not too many puns tonight, but uh, probably a few. There's a few who have come for that. <laughs> so we're going to talk about art in the service of conservation because really, as a naturalist, that, that's the the type of service and the drive that I have experienced through my life. So what is art? And uh, as was mentioned, in the early days, art and natural history were synonymous in many places. If you go back to the caves of Chavot in France, and when you see the detailed work of the lions displayed on the walls there, you see that that artist was a naturalist for sure, because uh, depicting the behavior so accurately of those moving lions was really astonishing. So art by Wikipedia, which is a wonderful source if you've ever heard of it. <laughs> you have to watch what you take off Wikipedia, but this is okay. Art is a diverse range of human activities in creating visual, auditory, or performing artifacts, which they call artworks, expressing the author's imaginative, conceptual ideas, or technical skill intended to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. That beauty and emotional power is what inspires me to do it so in the service of, act, of activism, in service of conservation. Uh, I've written a couple of books about the uh, Sutter Buttes of California, and the more recent one is on the table out there with the other books, if you're interested in there. And uh, David Cavagnaro wrote a very stirring uh, introduction to it, and he said, a naturalist is an interpreter one who can translate the complex language of nature into the vocabulary of the com he said common man, but I changed it, who can reach out to us from the heart of the natural world and lead us in. And I like to say that a naturalist cultivates informed imagination. If you look at that scene, there's a lot of ways you can look at it. You can look at purely at the pattern or the uh, impression of the ripples and the light and so forth. You can actually look at it as a geologist, you can look at it as a hydrologist to see how the rocks are arranged in a stream bed. There are many, many different ways that you can look at an image like this. And so the more knowledge you have, the more your imagination can take its leaps. And that's one of the things that I like about being a naturalist. I say that a naturalist, naturalist facilitates seeing more, sensing connections, because everything is interconnected, and translating nature's messages into deeper levels of awareness, understanding, and appreciation. They all go together. And a naturalist is motivated by joy and by love. That was one of the themes last night, the, the idea that you can have love when you're observing nature. And it doesn't make you less of a, a scientist or less of a person in some ways by having that emotional connection. In fact, it probably strengthens it. So we experience joy as we search for understanding and love for the living world within which we are created. And honestly, I, when it comes to this world, I'm in love. And natural history is an art form, because like other arts, its messages are, as was quoted in that Wikipedia definition, intended to be appreciated for their beauty or emotional power. So then let's look at what is conservation. And uh, this has been defined, one definition is a careful preservation and protection of something, especially planned management of a natural resource to prevent exploitation, destruction, or neglect. And I think many of you know we've had some interesting conservation challenges here, even in the city of Prescott or the county of Yavapai. And of course, the whole world is inflicted with the damage that humans are doing to the natural environment. So conservation, I think, is really, really important. And it's clear that we say what we love. If we don't really care about something, then why invest our time, our energy, our resources in it? So the intersection of art and conservation is love. Well, I'm going to provide a little personal history. 
I was white-haired when I was a kid, and I'm white-haired now, so I've come full circle. <laughs> and I think I've been nature boy my whole life. Uh, I, my professional career started when, at age 14 when I was a merit badge counselor at a Boy Scout camp, and I taught merit badges in nature, forestry, soil and water conservation, wildlife management, bird study, reptile study, and fishing. And that was at the tender age of 14. So I've been doing this sort of thing for a while. And I grew up on uh, the shores, or relatively close, you know, between the Cascades and uh, Puget Sound, north of Seattle. And so I grew up with lots of access to wildlife and to beautiful natural places, although it's getting too populated up there for me right now. But from an early age, I developed an appreciation for the names of things, but tried to go beyond the names for what is the function of this? Where does it fit ecologically? Why is, is it, does it look this way? And then I certainly discovered a lot of beauty in all of it, even in the old truck there that is being covered by uh, moss and algae and so forth in that wet climate. We don't see that here in Arizona. And the wildlife, were, it was abundant where I lived. Uh, along Camino Island, which is close to where I lived, you could walk along the beach and see an eagle's nest about every mile along the bluffs there. It's not that way. There's still eagles there, but not in the same number because there's so many houses there now. But, but uh, snow geese would come every winter and, uh, in this, to the Skagit Flats and, and around this little town of Standard where I grew up. So it was an inspiring place. I knew from an early age that I wanted to be a, a wildlife biologist. So after I graduated from my little town of Standard, Washington, I went to Washington State University, which is way over on the other side of the state. But it was good to get away. It's always good to get away from home and, and learn things. And they had a wildlife biology program. So I was an undergraduate there, and I was really lucky to get a summer job with the Fish and Wildlife Service as a student trainee in wildlife biology. So I served at the National Bison Range in Montana after my freshman year in 1965, and then uh, Malheur Refuge in Oregon, and then I was the only student trainee who ever got to go to Alaska. I went to the Kenai Moose Range in Alaska, now called the Kenai National Wildlife Refuge. And then once I graduated, I worked at McNary Refuge in Washington, uh, that's when Uncle Sam came along, however, and drafted me for the Vietnam War. So uh, I had to leave my actual, my intended uh, PhD work at, at the University of Montana studying sage grouse. Had to give that up and go to uh, Vietnam. But uh, that's okay. I, I did my time. Uh, it was not a really good time to be a serviceman at that time because the Vietnam War was opposed by many. And, and so there's a lot of prejudice against us, even though we went there without uh, our intention of being drafted and so forth. But today, every, it, the, the tide has turned, and everywhere I go, people say, thank you for your service. So I just want to say, that's a minor part of my service. My service really is dedicated to the whole world and has been ever since. Teaching at Prescott College was service. There's no question. It wasn't for, for, wasn't for money, <laughs> that's for sure. <laughs> But it was a wonderful place to teach. And I continue to do that sort of thing with all the work that I'm doing now. Oh, I worked at Mount here again after I came back from Vietnam for a couple of years as a wildlife biologist and enjoyed that a lot. But I had uh, some academic aspirations. So I went to the University of Arizona and studied scale quail, the little bird on the lower right. A wonderful social organism, really great in the grasslands and mesquite covered plains of the southeast Arizona. And I took a course in scientific illustration, which was kind of an impetus for um, preparing myself for the art, which came much later. It's kind of interesting. I, I kind of avoided art when I was young. I was interested, and I did a, there was a Keep Washington Green uh, poster contest that everybody in the, every kid in the state did. And I did a poster of an elk walking through a burned forest or something like this, and it really was pretty good. And they disqualified me because they thought somebody else did it. They didn't <laughs> think a kid could do it. And so I had some talent, but I, it just, I had to put it away because I was so disappointed that I didn't get a prize on that. So anyway, it was many, many years later before I actually started getting into doing art. And part of the reason was that I recognized that a lot of wildlife art wasn't accurate. It wasn't authentic. And one of the descriptions of natural history is that it's authentic and true to, to nature. And so that's one of the reasons that I expanded my interest from photography, which I was doing a lot of, to, uh, uh, to doing some paintings.
because I really knew the animals. That was the big difference. After Arizona, I went on to the University of Michigan and uh, did doctoral work for a couple years. And I taught field ornithology in the summer in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Really got to know the black flies and the mosquitoes and the horse flies and the deer <laughs> flies and uh, all those other things that make uh, Upper Peninsula of Michigan so exciting. But there are wonderful birds there too. Uh, when I took a statistics course for my doctoral work, I uh, analyzed, I got a hold of uh, nest record cards for many, many decades on the Kirtland's warbler, which is a very localized endemic, mostly in that country in Michigan, the Jack Pine Plains. And so I did an analysis of their breeding records in there and published it and then went, gave a presentation on an ornithological meeting in Winnipeg. And so that's why the Kirtland's warbler is there. And I started doing a few paintings at that time. I had actually started a little bit at Malheur Refuge uh, doing a few paintings just for fun. <clears throat> then in 1976, I moved to the Sutter Buttes of California because the landowner there wanted to start a, an experiment of treating private lands for public access. His, his motivation was to prevent the state from taking it over as a state park. And so he thought is he could justify that uh, he was using this land for interpretation and access, then the state wouldn't take his land away. It was a really interesting thing. So I moved out to uh, the Sutter Buttes of California. It's the only mountain range in the central, 400 mile long central valley of California. And it's really an amazing place. And uh, I have a book out there that some of you might like to take a look at. And I wrote and illustrated two books at that time. I was leading international trips and uh, then I started painting in earnest because we had a gallery. We had to have some paintings in there. Actually, we had a lot of good stuff in there, but I was inspired by the work of other artists and I got into it more seriously at that time. Th then I moved up to Eugene, Oregon in 1985 and uh, I was suffering from some pretty bad illness at that time, so it kind of limited. I was still leading some international trips, but uh, I was suffering quite a bit. You could see some of the places that I went, Alaska with the moose, antlers, and uh, Kenya, and then uh, Brazil, the, the Amos National Park. But I started my family and was recovering and uh, started painting much more seriously. And since it rains a lot up in there, unlike here, I have to be outside all the time because it's sunny typically or, or very interesting out. And up there it rained a lot, so it kept me inside and that was good for painting. Then in 1991, I took my job at Prescott College and uh, I had to swallow my pride to accept this four-letter word called job. <laughs> At that time, I, I really loved freelancing. It was a little bit of a shock to take a job. But Prescott College, when I read the catalog, I thought, wow, this is the school I would have created if I could have. It's pretty amazing. So I taught environmental studies there for 27 years, had wonderful students. And the nice thing is the Southwest is our classroom, so we got to take van field trips all over the place and really enjoyed it's experiential education, as you can see here, with the students actively using nets to capture uh, wetland organisms or wading in the streams or whatever. The, in 2004, I did that sec second book on the Sutter Buttes, and that's me uh, reading from my, my book at that time at a bookstore in California. And the very first class I taught at Prescott College, which I don't think anybody in the country has ever taught before, is called Interpreting Nature Through Art and Photography. And I taught the students the basics of drawing and art and also photography. And the students would choose a theme and we'd, we would pursue that theme. And most of the time it was a conservation theme so that we, at the end of the term, we would put on a, a gallery exhibition like students are showing here. And we would also do a slideshow, originally with slides and then later with digital things. And, uh, it, it really was a wonderful class. It exposed a lot of students to really doing something, art for conservation. That's really what it's all about. And uh, really a wonderful experience to do that. So I'll have many good memories of that particular class. I'm still leading trips to places like Antarctica and Tanzania and Uganda and, and uh, many other places. And uh, because my experience with ecotourism, I kind of got in on the ground floor and I led ecotours, many, many different places. So I wrote a major chapter for an international wildlife management book on uh, the impacts of humans, or the impacts of tourism on wildlife, which is uh, one of my academic accomplishments, I guess. I did some interpretive ink drawings, some, some of them associated with that interpreting nature class. 
But some like the coexisting with urban wildlife there was a little book that one of my former students had uh, written and I did the illustrations for. We have some copies of it here, very nice little book and it's based on the center of Arizona Highlands. And then the Chihuahua Pine I just did for fun <laughs> because it's a cool, cool uh, thing. And then the, the top medium here uh, that is black scratchboard. And that is, a, and you'll see some of my scratchboard work in the gallery too. But that's a completely ink coated chalk surfaced substance that you can scratch away to get different effects. And so I used a scalpel, I used a steel wool, I used a variety of different things to scratch away those kinds of details. It's a really neat medium. And what's that? Oh, thanks. Yeah, yeah. I like rain. Don't see much of it. I wish it would rain tonight. Okay. Uh, anyway, then uh, Chris Hoy wrote a nice little book inspired, I think, by the uh, Elks Theater. He's, he's a good local writer, very involved with uh, CWAG, the Citizen Water Advocacy Group. And he asked me to illustrate it. So I did scratchboard drawings for that. For example, on the trunk, all of that's scratched in. All those kinds of details are scratched in. And then I would stipple ink in after I, like for example on the hat there, I would scratch it, I would uh, stipple in the little details to uh, create some things. And you can see a better version of that upper scratch board on the left in the, in the show. And I got very involved in local conservation issues. He mentioned the Grand Dells Preservation Foundation. I'm also one of the co-founders of Save the Dells. My wife Joanne Olders is the chair and she's doing fantastic work that impresses me tremendously. And so this was a, uh, a little panel that we had at the uh, Yavapai Performing Arts Center. We packed that place. I think it was the biggest pres uh, uh, presence of people at something like that. The mayor even came and we got the mayor to say, oh, you know, 25% is supposed, in a planned area development is supposed to be saved for natural open space. And he says, oh, I think we should do 50%. <laughs> he could see the handwriting on the wall and he got defeated badly at the next election because uh, a lot of people thought he was a little bit too affiliated with the developers. And uh, so anyway, we've had some great successes, which I'll talk a little bit more about, in the Granite Dells, uh, the Verde River, and Del Rio Springs. And even Del Rio Springs now is in the progress of being uh, going to be made a state park. So it's a little late for the spring. The spring is dying from groundwater pumping in the big Chino Aquifer, or little Chino Aquifer, which supplies Prescott and Chino Valley, and to some extent, uh, Prescott Valley as well. So uh, uh, Bob mentioned my uh, Wild Wednesday S photo essays and a naturalist is a storyteller and it doesn't matter what medium, whether it be art or writing or photography, I'm a storyteller. That's, I've learned that about myself. And a story artfully told can awaken emotions that result in action. And that's really one of the objectives that I have. It's a lot of work to put away to gather those Wild Wednesday essays. But I'm hoping that they're reaching enough people that they can in turn can uh, do something important. And I think that conservation is best served by informed and inspired activism. So while I was at the Sutter Buttes, so just to get, to get back to the theme of why we're here tonight with the gallery show and so forth, I started doing paintings in earnest, as I said. And so these are some of the paintings that I did. I think three of them are watercolor, and I think the jackrabbit might be an acrylic painting. But the Sutter Buttes is that little mountain range in the background and all of all of those. And I was also using art to raise money through Ducks Unlimited, which has been very successful uh, throughout North America, perhaps beyond raising money for waterfowl habitat. And so uh, they have these big uh, events where they auction off artwork and uh, ply the, the guests with lots of wine so that their inhibitions are down and they buy a lot of artwork. And so we artists uh, donate art uh, for many of those kinds of things because we, we want to see the ultimate effect. I participated in several uh, major art shows. I went to Kansas City, Missouri and my red-tailed hawk, immature there with a the fly on the fence, got best in show for non-game birds, which was a thrill and then the uh, coyote and the yucca in watercolor was selected for a special thing, Wildlife the Artist's View a show. And I got to go back to Liaki Woods and Art Museum in, in Wausau, Wisconsin. And it's a, they do birds and art every year, big uh, thing. It's one of the most prestigious 
bird art shows in the world. So that was nice to get that kind of recognition. And then I came to Prescott College and stopped all of this. But I, uh, again, some more of the uh, things that I was inspired to do while I was leading safaris, a lot of them were uh, commissions from people who were on the safaris. So here's some examples from my eco-tours in Africa and from some of them in South America, particularly in Brazil, but also the two lower pictures there were in the Galapagos Islands in Ecuador. And here are some Magellanic penguins in Argentina. A couple who have traveled with me many times wanted a painting of Magellanic penguins, but they left it completely up to me to create a, a composition. So I used a th it, three elements is often a fairly strong compositional element. I wanted uh, sort of to get the bird to stand out up there against the dark rocks behind and the muscles and things like that. So I put the, uh, the foreground ones in a playful pose and had a lot of time. The design on this took way, way longer than the artwork and uh, than the painting, but the artwork took plenty of time too, believe me. This was an interesting piece. Uh, I've, I've banded hundreds and hundreds of geese while I worked at Wildlife Refuges, so I know them really well. I know their topography and so forth. But in this one, I wanted to emphasize backlighting, uh, transparency of the water, reflectivity. And then because this is watercolor, let's see if I can use this. You see the, the grasses over here? Those light grasses, you have to work sort of with negative space. You don't just paint them on like you do with oil or acrylic. You have to work behind them and paint the dark areas so that the light areas come forward. So it's really, really hard to do something that detailed in watercolor. But I had fun with it. I like challenges, and you'll see in there more examples of, of ridiculous ways of using watercolor. <laughs> uh, I, was, I led a couple of trips to the Birds of Prey natural area uh, in the Snake River in uh, Idaho. And then after one of them, I went to the, Birds of, the World Center for Birds of Prey in Boise, Idaho. And they let me sit for an hour with my camera and my sketchbook in a flight cage with several golden eagles. So I really got good reference material for golden eagles. It's kind of been my totem bird anyway. I really like those birds. And so these are a couple of the paintings that I did. The golden eagle on the left is sitting on a rock wall of andesite, as would be typical of the Sutter Buttes in California. I want to make sure my geology is accurate as well. Those plagio plagioclase crystals that you see in the rock there are actually the white of the board showing through, because with watercolor, you avoid that. And then the one on the right is in a typical Great Basin uh, habitat there. And I had a lot of fun with the sagebrush. These were commissions, uh, one in California, Oakland. I went to uh, a couple's yard, and I saw what they had in the yard there with columbine. I saw the hummingbirds coming in. And so I actually got a hold of a columbine plant, and I studied it. And then I came up and did uh, basic shapes to create a composition there, and then I made the columbine work with those shapes. So it's, it's not a columbine that exists specifically. It's a columbine that's designed around the curves that I created there. And uh, then I did the hummingbird separately, and then I moved it around until I found the perfect spot to put it. So uh, there's a lot of thought that goes into composition. The same with the robins at the Madrone. I never would have been able to get that kind of detail if I hadn't had a, a dead bird in my freezer that I could take out and thaw and look at the wings and things like that. I had a salvage permit. It was legal. You guys can't go home and, and collect a bird off the road and take it home. That's not legal unless you have a salvage permit, right? But I think if you find a, a bird, I think you might be able to take it to the Natural History Institute. Is that right, Bob? No? no? OK. Can't even do, can't even do that. They're, they don't have a permit. They're not legal. OK. <laughs> He doesn't want a freezer full of birds. <laughs> OK. And so here's a, I like wrens. Um, we have a rock wren here, sort of an impressionistic one. And then a canyon wren, where its pattern kind of blends in with the lichens on the rocks. So I put a lot of thought into composition. You notice they're not right dead center. When I teach photography, I make sure I tell people not to put, uh, and there are exceptions, of course. But most of the time, you don't want something in the dead center because it's not so interesting. So you want to have some uh, room for the animal to move and so forth. There's a lot of thought put into composition, dynamic things, especially if you have something that's acting, like the acorn woodpeckers on an alligator juniper, or the elf owls in an oak tree. 
Now, many people with watercolor will put a wash on. They might uh, use uh, something to screen out, to block the, the shapes of the birds later uh, with, uh, what is that called? Uh, what is Deb? When you put something on it, if you don't want the... Frisket. Yeah, frisket, that's the word, right. And I don't do that, though. I, do the, I did the birds first, and then I added all that with a small brush, all that uh, background material to make them stand out like that. So I, I do things the hard way sometimes. Same with this chickadee. Uh, the important thing here was design. I understood I had maple leaves to work with, but this is no specific maple thing. I created a basic uh, abstract design, and then I built a, the maple leaves in, and same thing with the kestrel landing on that log. Again, with the bluebird, it's a nice little bright spot against a pretty monochromatic subject there. But I like working with textures. Uh, the textures of the wood or the textures of the, of the horseshoes or the wood on the fence and things like that. And Tom will recognize the painting on the left, the red-faced warbler. He happens to have the original of that. And I'm really delighted that that's in his personal collection. The bird was done in watercolor, transparent watercolor, and the fern was done in acrylic. You notice that, the, uh, that there are things, let's see if I can point it out, if I can find my, there it is. There are places in here where I have little gaps, where there's little breaks in the fern. I didn't want the fern, uh, like here's a good example. See that little break there where there's a couple little things have been broken off. I've, I've seen some uh, bird artwork which is very static. The plants and the birds themselves really look like they're just a flat thing, uh, almost too perfect if you want to put it that way. They don't have those little, uh, oddities that really we always find in nature. So I try to make sure that my things look realistic that way. And there's a nice elegant trogon in a sycamore. And I put a little moth up there toward the top. See that? There's a little moth there. And there's stories behind all of these things. I, the spotted owl, I spent some good time in a preserve in Northern California where I watched spotted owls for quite a bit of time. And Cooper socks, I see them all the time. I have lots of reference material for Cooper socks. A couple pieces that I really enjoyed doing. The, the fawn on the left was done in acrylic. And I don't know, you probably can't tell it from here, but there's, I did a lot of detail in here. And on this bed straw right here, every little hair is on there. You know, bed straw is the stuff that sticks to you like Velcro. And uh, it, w it wouldn't have been necessary for most people's vision, but I put every little hair on there. so. I, I mean, it's just kind of fun. I enjoy doing the painting. And then getting the Fibonacci numbers in the, in the cones, the spirals, and so forth, right? It's all fun. And again, on the Montezuma quail over here, these grasses here are left by working behind it. So I didn't paint the grasses. I painted the black, dark spaces behind them and just left the, that. So it's fun. And that, those are two of my favorite ones from the early years. The, Vermilion flycatcher and the house sparrow. Notice where they're positioned. They're not put in the dead center. They've got room to move into that thing, and then there are other things there to, to draw your eye and to uh, keep you interested, hopefully. So both of those are watercolor. And uh, on the thistles, the dry thistles on the right on the, with the house sparrow, I had to, with small brush, I had to paint around that with the dark color to get those to sand out. It took many, many tries to get that right. And then, of course, trying to get some uh, sort of old glass look was kind of fun. Then, as I mentioned, there was a 27-year hiatus when I was teaching at Prescott College. I did teach interpreting nature through art and photography, but I didn't have time to do the detailed paintings at that time. And I kind of thought my painting career was over. But as I was winding down at Prescott College, one of my students, Felipe Guerrero, who was the education coordinator out at the Highland Center for Natural History, asked me if I'd be willing. He had seen some pictures of some of my earlier paintings. He said, could you do some illustrations for us because we want to have uh, some uh, interpretive displays along our discovery trail out there. I said, well, I can try. So we sat down and we came up with a list of the things that he wanted to have done for the different ecosystems that are being portrayed out there. So the very first painting that I did, having not painted for 27 years pretty much, was the butterfly on the left. And very small. 
And I thought, okay, I can still do this. My paints were old. <laughs> All my painting supplies were, thir supplies were 30 or 40 years old, and some of them had dried up. But, and then the little uh, plains lubber there. So they're being used in interpretive displays. I did some birds, cute little things. And I, I left them pretty open because they're going to be superimposed over photographs for the interpretive displays. And here are some of the reptiles. Hey, scales are tough to do. I'd rather do feathers or fur. But uh, every little scale up there, like if you look at those snakes, those scales are all there. And I think the hardest one was the canyon tree frog with those little lumps. Boy, that was hard to do. But I love doing the uh, uh, horned lizard. And of course, they're anteaters. And so I, I did that little ant. And boy, it was the last thing I did. And there's a lot of little detail. And I was sweating it, because if I had dropped one piece of paint on that white board, outside of that, the whole thing would have been gone with watercolor. So that was scary, but uh, it worked out. And a couple of the other illustrations that are there. And there's a few drawings, I think, still left from that. Maybe not here. I, most of them I did in watercolor. I did a few on clay board, which is a, a version of scratch board, where you uh, ink and then you scratch away details. That little javelina. The painting was, well, I can't show this to everybody probably. Well, it's just a tiny little thing, just like this. And I did it with one brush and one pigment. Van Dyke brown with a number one brush. So all those little white hairs that you see, they're actually just the, the paper showing through. Not, there's no white hairs painted on there. And so it was really fun to do that because it seemed impossible, but it was fun. And this is how the work was used. And I have to give credit to Felipe for his um, design inspiration and for Krista Agostino who did the Photoshop work that combined the photos in the background are my photos as well and then she arranged all these things and Felipe wrote the text. So they're beautiful. If you've not been out to the Discovery Garden in uh, Highland Center for Natural History, you really should do so. It's a delightful experience with a lot of good interpretation. So there's the grasslands, there's the chaparral, there's our happy little leaping collared peccary. I, I bet you didn't know that pigs can fly. <laughs> And uh, she, she took liberty and switched things in different directions and stuff like that, which they are capable of doing. Some created some really nice uh, displays. You really should go out and check it out. Then after that, uh, Highland Center, again, uh, inspiration for me to do these things. I, I don't think I, I wasn't retired yet from Prescott College, so I had, but it was great because they wanted uh, some pollinators, and specifically a butterfly series. And so in the show I did here in 2019, I had a bunch of butterfly uh, paintings at that time. These are a few of them. And uh, that was a lot of fun. Again, uh, if you see the originals, you can see every little scale in there. And it's fun, fun to do. I like detail. And then they uh, asked me to do some uh, hummingbirds for the pollinator gardens. So these are some of the pieces that I did. Again, I worked with Felipe. He, had ideas of what he wanted to see. And you have a rufous hummingbird chasing a broad-tailed hummingbird away from a, and that's very typical. The rufous, they're feisty little things. They'll chase anybody. And then a little bit more recently, I did the hummingbird on the lower left to show iridescence. And that's watercolor, so it was a big challenge to create that iridescence with watercolor. I, uh, Highland Center for Natural History had a, has had an annual fall uh, plain air art festival out there. And I was participating for two years. And I couldn't do it this last year because I was traveling. But uh, so that's where you paint in, in the wild. Most people do oil paintings in the field of landscapes. But I'm a naturalist, and so I'm much more interested in working on close-up things. So you could see me there in the woods out by Constellation Trails working on a watercolor, which is the one just to the right of the last wild geranium of the year. It was the last one that was blooming. And uh, then I also did a few pieces there of some of the rocks. The yuccas, I was freezing to death while I was doing the yucca. It was terrible to do that in the field. But I did. And then on the pygmy nuthatch, I did that at the Highland Center grounds there. Um, I had a little photo of the pygmy nuthatch because they're not going to stay in one spot. There's no <laughs> way. So I, I used that. As, but, but the bark I painted right on the spot while people were talking to me all day. It was kind of fun. 
And then I belong to an organization called Artists and Biologists Unite for Nature, or ABUN, and they're artists from all over the world who contribute their artwork for conservation issues, usually for endangered species, uh, things like that. So in the steppes of Asia, up in the mountains, there's the palace's cat, which is the cutest fat little thing <laughs> that you ever saw. I love those. And the snow leopard, uh, the palace's cat sold this last year, but the snow leopard's still in the show over here. And those, those are then used by those conservation researchers to uh, raise money for their projects or to interpret things. Lions are in trouble in Africa. You might think that they're a common thing, but many, many have been shot for trophies or poached, or, or sometimes there's conflict with human beings. And there's ever-increasing numbers of human beings in Africa, as you can imagine. So lions are really in trouble. So I did a lioness there, and of course a jaguar, which used to be fairly regular here, even in Arizona, back in the early days before they were all persecuted and killed off. A few more subjects that were done for Artists and Biologists Unite for Nature. Uh, there's a meerkat rescue place where meerkats are being persecuted by farmers. They're cute little uh, mongooses, of course. There's a pied tamarind, which is a marmoset that's found only around Manaus in Brazil, and uh, a giant otter, uh, typical of the Amazon. So these were all done for conservation projects. The nene, the Hawaiian goose, which was an endangered species. It might, I'm not sure if it's off the list yet or not. Do you know? It's not on the, it's still listed. Okay, it's still listed. And the Lazen albatross. These are pastel pieces here. And a lot of my work in recent years has been with the Granadelles Preservation Foundation, which is a nonprofit, a 501c3, and with the Save the Dells, which is a political action committee. And Save the Dells actually formed to combat an annexation proposal by Arizona Eco Development. There's no eco in that development at all. It was definitely a horrifying looking plan. And uh, they were going to uh, pretty much destroy most of the beautiful land along the Peavine and Iron King trails that visitors sort of took for granted. They just assumed that they were saved lands, but they were not. There's only a narrow right of way along the Rails to Trails projects. So we proposed from the very beginning saving 500 key acres in, of Dell's land, and uh, the developer just scoffed at us. But in the end, by working for five long years, we got what we wanted, pretty much what we wanted. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> It, it was a, a really tough effort, and, and uh, it took resilience and persistence on our part. But anyway, this is what uh, would have been, Matt Turner took this aerial photo with his drone, but you can see, I'm going to talk a little bit later about Elizabeth Creek, which is this creek that flows up through here and goes back to Glassford Hill, this beautiful area here, and the Peabine Trail and Point of Rocks. But this entire drainage would have been filled with roads and houses in, in high density, and the way they do it is uh, by mass grading. They go actually and just go in and level the land, take out all the trees and shrubs that are there. You know, this is a floodplain. We actually saved the developer a lot of trouble because sooner or later that development would have been flooded out. I've seen this thing wall to wall water, and, but nevertheless, that was the proposal. So we worked really hard to uh, save that particular ecosystem. <laughs> yeah, you're most welcome. Because this is what you would have seen out there. This is ironically called uh, Grand Dells Estates. Now they have a big sign calling it the Dells. But it's outside the Dells. It, they have a view of the Dells for sure. Look at all the big cats up on the hill there. Well, that displaced any of the big cats that were in that habitat before. And uh, so basically, it's about our values. And if this would have happened, our aesthetic, ecological, recreational, inspirational, and economic values all would have been damaged. And so we did not want to see that happen in the heart of the Dells. So Save the Dells had a lot of wonderful events and public meetings to mobilize the public. And they worked behind the scenes. And I say they, I mean I'm part of that they, uh, with the city and the developer to try to achieve a win-win-win for all. Uh, initially, I think the city thought we were trying to oppose them. But no, we were trying to actually make a deal that was worthwhile for the city because in the past they just rubber stamped everything, every development that came along. This way the city came out way ahead. They got this land for public open space and tremendous recreation potential and a lot of economic value. And uh, we helped them to get that. And we, the developer was happy too because we shifted the development north more toward the airport and uh, in the uh, 
negotiations, they got the water they needed for that. So it worked out well for everybody. And I have to say it's been the most effective citizen action group in the history of Prescott. So then artisan biologists unite for nature. I've been doing all these projects around the world and I got to know the founders of uh, ABAN. In fact, one of the founders was my close friend from my safaris in Brazil. And so uh, when they saw what was going on here in the Granite Dells, they decided, okay, we're not gonna do endangered species this time. We're gonna do for ABAN number 27, we're gonna do the Granite Dells, the first endangered landscape. So I provided over 300 photos for artists to work from and uh, free of charge and everything. And we got all kinds of art produced around there to, uh, to go toward preserving and protecting and raising uh, awareness of the Granite Dells. So here are some of the pieces that we had. That's my little woodpecker on the lower left there, my little uh, ladderback woodpecker. But we had wonderful artists. Uh, no one has to be a professional artist to be an ape on there. They can be a beginner, they can be someone advanced. The idea is that they really want to put their work to service. I did this, this photo of the stormy day in the Dells on the, on the top there in the center, and uh, five, different artists did, or, yeah, five different artists did different interpretations from that one photo. The one on the left there where you see the pen and ink work, or pencil work, he, made, he turned it into elephants. See the elephant here? And there's an elephant over here. And there's a human or mummy or something, a couple of the people there. Oh, he's a very creative German guy. He doesn't speak English at all. But uh, his name is Snan. I thought he was being clever because that's Hans backward. I figured his name was Hans, but it's not. It's Snan. <laughs> <laughs> so we were slowed down a little bit by COVID, as most people were. But eventually, we had a spring for the Dells art show and auction up at the Finn restaurant at Touchmark. And uh, that was a wonderful uh, opportunity. We raised almost $20,000 for the uh, work in the Dells, for the Dells Foundation at that particular event, but a tremendous amount of work. I hope, hope I never have to do it again. <laughs> and this is a beautiful valley that was going to be filled with roads and houses, even though I've seen it flooded from wall to wall down here. And it took five years to get this win, win, win. And uh, this is the drainage of Elizabeth Creek, which we named for Elizabeth Ruffner. And uh, Becky, her, her daughter, is here tonight. And uh, she, of course, was a wonderful inspiration for all of us. It's important that you see what, what really changed here. If you look at the map on the left, you can see all these different colors. Let's see if I can find that. All these different colors re represent different densities of housing. These little green lines are their projected open space. Those little tiny green things are their projected open space, pretty minimal. Some of them right in the middle of a of an intense development. This is where the creek runs through, right like this. That's the creek runs through. All of that is a floodplain. All of that is heavily forested. It would have been destroyed. Now, what you can see is that down in here, they would have had a resort down in this particular area, a big resort, which would have re required crossing the Iron King Trail and crossing the Peavine Trail up here. And then this is a rocky peak here, but it's one acre lots all around it. All of this would have been developed. So when they, next in 2019, we got some improvement. Now they gave away this lower part. They gave away this peak, which is a peak, places that they couldn't build. They kept this as private open space. Still was not acceptable. But here's what we ended up with over here. All of this green down in here, 55% public open space, protecting the Iron King and Peavine Trails. I don't know why they're calling this open space along the roads up here. That's ridiculous. But, Anyway, this is the land that we have saved, and we are so excited about that. So on the maps, the little creek that flows through this drainage did not have a name. So the developer called it No Name Creek, which we thought was kind of a result. It's like it's not even a creek at all. It has no name. And so we persuaded the city to change this to Elizabeth Creek to honor Elizabeth Ruffner, who lived almost to 100 years. And she was a tireless advocate for open space conservation, historic preservation, arts and humanities projects, and more. And you did not want to cross her. She was a very effective uh, warrior, an eco-warrior, really, for all of these uh, causes. She was fantastic. And so we're naming it. Uh, notice that it's Elizabeth with an S. You have to make sure we do this correctly. And we're going to install two signs with her 
portrait on it and uh, a little bit about her legacy along the two places where the trail costs, crosses the, the major trails. Yeah, and then here we have uh, the conceptual map of what we envision. The blue line here, let's see if I can find my cursor again. The blue line represents the rocky granite dells. Here, this red part right here is what we save for open space. This little red part up in here is going to be developed as this is, this is the Granite Dells estates being developed. That's private land. But so that is that particular area. And most of the, much of this right now is, is actually owned by the city and it's green. Next week, however, we're going to have projected purchase of much of Glassford Hill as part of the regional park and preserve that we've been pushing for. So our conception from the very start five years ago we started identifying this green line as a potential for a greater Granite Dells Regional Park and Preserve of which all of these other lands, as much as is available, could become part of. And so that's been our dream, our conception for a long time. And it's coming. So next week on Tuesday at 10 o'clock on the Courthouse Square, the state is holding an auction for several thousand acres of, Granite, of the uh, state land on Glassford Hill uh, which the city, the county, and Prescott Valley will jointly buy as toward the Greater Granite Dells Regional Park and Preserve. And so that's coming right up. Uh, please don't go and try to outbid them. <laughs> we, don't, we don't want that. But anyway, this is really exciting stuff. And you can see how Glassford Hill actually, it's a young volcanic rock that slightly overlies the top of part of the Granite Dells. Part, the Granite Dells is 1.4 billion year old rock. And uh, Glassford Hill is a young volcano, only maybe 15, 16 million years old. This baby. But it covered up part of the Dells. Can you believe it? Well, of course, the Dells formed way under the earth. And only about 13 million years ago did it come up to the surface anyway. So uh, if you were around before that, you missed it. So another organization I'm involved heavily with is Biocultural Conservation Institute, or BCI. It was founded by a Prescott College student. And I was. Uh, recruited to be chair of the board and, and serve there. I'm still on the board, but I'm no longer chair, thank heavens. But uh, the mission is to empower local communities to connect to and protect their native wildlife through education, research, and livelihood enhancement. You realize to manage wildlife, you really have to manage people. So it's really an important thing. You just have to be aware of that. So that's why it's Biocultural Conservation Institute. This last February, I was uh, in the Amboseli area and visited one of our projects that uh, originally it initiated about 2007, the year 2007. And it's amazing how challenging life is for the wildlife and for the people in that arid landscape. But these people, the Maasai here, were displaced from the Amboseli National Park. And uh, they're struggling to make a good living here. Uh, one of the things, projects we had was uh, Twiga trackers, which Twiga is a Swahili word for giraffe. And they've had been doing research using uh, photographs and patterns and so forth to study uh, the giraffes, all of which are endangered. There's four species now, but they're all endangered. And that's a pastel drawing that I did uh, based on my experiences with giraffes. I also was lucky enough one time to go to Uganda, and one of the parks that we visited was Windy Impenetrable National Park. This was a few years ago. And uh, got the opportunity to visit with the mountain gorillas, with the chimpanzees, and you can see where the national park, where the forest is dense, it's beautiful. But at the very edge of the park, all the land is converted to agriculture. And all of that land would have been destroyed if the park hadn't been established. Unfortunately, the, when establishing the park, they kicked the batwa, the hunter-gatherer pygmies, who were living in the forest, out of the forest and gave them no compensation. So those poor people uh, who have been persecuted by other tribes in uh, Uganda for a long time, they're basically landless and uh, their livelihood was in the forest. And so I'm, we're working with two groups in, in and around Buendi National Park to try to improve their lives. So I talked Aban into doing a fundraiser for them. And I supplied most of the photos for that. And it was the title I came up with was Believing in Buendi. And artists, again, produced a lot of work. These are three pieces I did for it. The uh, Colobus Monkey uh, painting right there was purchased locally. And $1,000 went directly over to that cause. The chimpanzees for sale in here. So if you want to help with this project, you can buy the chimpanzee. That money will go to Uganda and so forth. And our partners over there have done some amazing things. They've put in quite a few of these well structures. 
uh, the women and children have to walk for hours to find water, to bring water back to their uh, groups. And it's dangerous and it's, it's extremely hard work. And so this one group we're working with, Green Mountain Initiative, and I'm on their board, uh, they've come in and taken, found springs, mostly just muddy springs that people or livestock would trample. And they've converted them by creating these cement structures and the pipes and so forth so people can get fresh water, fresh spring water right from that. Really amazing, and they've done a whole bunch of these. And uh, so we're constantly trying to raise money for that. Yeah, they're really doing some neat work. Really neat stuff. So I'm really proud of what we're doing over there. And the Green Mountain Initiative, but we're doing this through Biocultural Conservation Institute. So we collect the money and we uh, wire it over to them. And here's another project, uh, the Batwa Community Development Association. It's, it's a big park, so this is actually in a different part of the park. And it's where this fellow named Alex is uh, doing fantastic work teaching the Batwa how to do agriculture on a sustainable basis. Really great project. And there's a lot of education. And they're actually doing arts and crafts for uh, tourists as well. So we're supporting both of those projects. And uh, BCI has a, a store, an online store. So if you go to Biocultural Conservation Institute, you can buy uh, stuff like this, which includes some of my artwork on uh, things. I, I get nothing. It's all a donation, of course. But, and uh, Lisa Kaplan, an artist in Seattle, has donated her original painting of Rafiki, who was a famous silverback mountain gorilla. And so that's available through there. And that money will all go to help the battle babies over there. So uh, Lisa's a good supporter, friend, too. Then uh, Bob mentioned a number of organizations. I'm also involved with Artists for Conservation, which is the world's leading artist group that does art primarily for conservation. It's really a great group. And it's a, a challenge to get into it. But I've been in the organization for five years. I've been in their festivals, uh, juried into their shows all five years. And the first one that I did was this not caving in portrait of a mountain lion. Uh, that was in their first festival and book. And then the next year I did uh, uh, this owl monkey painting, which is in here. You can see the original. Those are in the Amazon. Uh, the third year I did this pint-sized predator or pearl-spotted owlet, which is closely related to our pygmy, uh, our pygmy owls here. And that, that piece sold through the show. Uh, next year I did uh, the wood ducks, riparian riches, and that is in the display in here, it's watercolor. Uh, that, this was also in their book that year. It's the uh, Diadem Sifaka from uh, Madagascar. Have you seen that? Yeah, you've seen it. It's a beautiful animal. Wow. And this year, uh, the painting is still in the, the hands of AFC, uh, the crown cranes, which I see. It's a national bird of Uganda. And then uh, this piece is here. That's a pastel piece I did of a long-crested eagle. It's also in their book. So anyway, that's another project where I'm using art for conservation. I do occasionally take commissions. So these are a few of the commissions that I did uh, within the last couple of years. I bet you do. <laughs> There's the one of the owners right there. Let's, I should go back. Yeah, that's his uh, J right there, Scrub J. Very good. <laughs> and uh, the burrowing owls uh, that you see over there, and the great horned owl was actually uh, commissioned by the lady who bought the pearl spotted owl, a Tucson lady. So she wanted a great horned owl. She's an owl lover. And so I just wanted to show you a little bit of the process. I, this one is acrylic, and it's very, very detailed acrylic. It's in the show in there of, of a rhino. I've really had really good opportunities to study rhinos in the wild in Africa. And so you see I started out, you can't really see it, but there's a faint outline, a little basic pencil outline up there in the top. And I just kind of wanted to position the birds first and the ears. And then the second piece on the right, upper right, I started just doing a broad wash of uh, water, or this is acrylic, just a light wash to provide a ground base for it. And then the third one, I started to put in uh, some of the details in there. And uh, the fourth one is when I finished every one of those cotton picking wrinkles. <laughs> they have so many wrinkles. It's just amazing. But you have to give shape to them. You have to really give credit to those wrinkles or it won't look realistic. So if you have time, take a look, close look at the wrinkles in there. I'm pretty proud of those wrinkles. <laughs> Not that I have any or anything. You know. <laughs> uh, this is a real tiny piece, and I couldn't find it for the show in here, but I do have, I found it now. It's at home. 
And it's a real tiny piece, and it's a little cottontail ex uh, discovering a beetle going through. Uh, this one is an acrylic piece of a long, no, of a uh, immature Marshall eagle. This eagle is about twice the size of our golden eagle or bald eagle. It's an enormous bird. They're capable of taking small antelopes. Look, yeah, look at those talons. It's a very talented bird. <laughs> That's for you. <laughs> yeah, and uh, yellow-billed cuckoo, one of our riparian specialists here that deigned to come up from the tropics for a few months of the year to have their babies, and then they rush back to the tropics where they feel more at home. So that's a yellow-billed cuckoo. This one was fun. Uh, Joanne and I have visited Petrified Forest National Park, and it's a pretty stark landscape in many places with the petrified wood lying around all over the ground. But one of the birds that we see there, and we saw this hopping around on a, uh, one of these petrified logs, was a rock red, which makes total sense because this is petrified wood. And so, uh, again, in watercolor, it was a challenge to get the sort of the shininess of the rock. That one took an uh, inordinate amount of time, a cottonwood log there, uh, canyon rend, which I see a lot out of in the Dells. They actually come to our place, so it's, it's one of the birds that we love to see. And this was a challenge. I had photographed a Canada goose with his wings up that I put in one of my photo essays, and somebody said, you ought to try painting that. I thought it was a joke. But I thought, OK, why not? I'll take the challenge. And so it's in there as well. Uh, Nubian woodpeckers from Africa, that's done with pastels. And then one of my most recent ones is the cassowary, right that here with its cask. And the, the bird is watercolor. The background is acrylic, because I couldn't get the watercolor dark enough to, to do with that dark background. So it's mixed media there. So anyway, you guys have been a wonderful audience. You've laughed at the right spots. So I appreciate that. <laughs> and I don't see too many people sleeping, so that's really great. But all of this, as a naturalist, it's all about respecting and protecting nature in every way possible through my paintings, my photos, my writing, my teaching. Uh, as part of the, of the NHI obligation here, not only this talk, but giving the show, I did a field experience, too. I had, we had 15 people sign up for that. And we went out to the new trail in the Dells called the Gateway Trail. And uh, <coughs> so this is a little shot as I'm teaching along the Gateway Trail. It's a really wonderful part. In that land we save from Arizona Eco Development. So anyway, I want to thank NHI again for the opportunity to have another show here and another talk. I want to thank all of you for coming. And uh, please stick around for the show and uh, have fun. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>
I'm really curious. The bird that's in that picture, where yeah. where does that bird come from? I've never seen a bird like that before. This is the most dangerous bird in the world, the cassowary. They can disembowel you with their claws. Uh, have you ever run into one, Brett? No. This is, this is a bird that you want to be careful about. They're extinct birds. They're just as dangerous. But this is, oh, they're big. They're a big bird. And uh, they're very strong and powerful. They're in New Guinea and northern Australia in the rainforest areas up in there. And uh, yeah, there are people who go there, but you better have a bodyguard because <laughs> they're kind of dangerous. So I saw a photograph that an Australian photographer did with uh, something like that. And I thought, well, that's great. So I wrote to him and asked him if I could use it as a reference. And he says, thank you. You're the first person who's ever asked to use one of my photos. Which, of course, you have to ask. It's illegal to use somebody else's photo unless you get permission. So he gave permission. He's very happy with the way it turned out. But, so I've never seen a cassowary, but it would be a cool bird to see. They swim in the ocean. Pardon? They swim in the ocean. They do. I saw that this week. Yeah, he said they swim in the ocean. And there was something on uh, YouTube or something this past week that showed a cassowary coming to shore. Uh, from the ocean, which just blew everybody's mind. That's not their typical habitat. <laughs> They're not a marine organism. But uh, yeah, it was swimming. I mean, you, if you're around enough, you're going to see something weird. Anything else? Well, you've been a great audience. Appreciate it. So the gallery will be open. I believe Walt will be sticking around. And as our uh, tradition here at the Natural History Institute, we give the presenter a hat.